Hey, everybody, and welcome to another lecture. Uh, this time, I am actually recording this from Lubbock, Texas, the mission home of the Lubbock, Texas mission. Uh, this is where my parents are on a mission. And so anyway, we ran down here to because they finish uh, in here at the end of June. So I figure this is where one last chance to come get some real barbecue and uh, see my parents before they head back to LA. So uh, that's where you're going to get this lecture from today. So uh, today we're talking about uh, crimes. So this week we're talking about crimes as well as torts. And then Friday uh, we'll do a live class where we will talk about Theranos. And this is a great modern case dealing with uh, crimes that businesses uh, can commit. Now, if you haven't checked yet, I would definitely go check my the Twitter. This is twitter.com slash profhales. Uh, because the top three right now, uh, as I make this, uh, the, the top three stories that I've got are all crimes. So the first one, uh, this isn't so much a business crime, although it's a crime against a business. This is a guy that just thought he'd go camp out on one of the islands that Disney uh, owns in Florida. This is Discovery Island. Um, yeah, you can't do that. Uh, the next one is uh, sex trafficking claims can proceed against Marriott. So people are suing Marriott. Um, uh, and their argument is that Marriott knew that there was sex trafficking going on at a number of their hotels, but didn't do anything about it. Why? Because they were making money off of um, these rooms being um, let. Okay. And then the last one, uh, this is fitting since I'm in Texas right now. Uh, Bluebell uh, pleads guilty to, if you remember this, it was a couple of years ago, uh, there was a Listeria outbreak with Bluebell ice cream. And so anyway, they're getting sued over that. Uh, the, the fourth one is super important, and we'll get to this later. This is the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team. Uh, they were suing because they were paid less than the men. Um, and that case was largely just dismissed um, for a lot of important reasons. And, uh, and so that's one that we'll definitely be talking about when we get to discrimination. Um, but yeah, just check that out. I should probably post more of these to Facebook as well. Um, and maybe I'll just start doing that. But uh, in the meantime, just know I am still tweeting out stories that are relevant for the things that we're covering in this class. So definitely check those out. All right, so with that, let me jump into my uh, slides for today. All right, so let's present this. Uh, so you can kind of see what's going on here. So like I said, today we're talking about crimes. Um, and, and I think it's important at the outset to just run through this one more time, this idea that the, the criminal justice system has two competing and sometimes, well, often at odds um, priorities, the idea of justice and mercy. And those are the two sides of the scale. Now, if we're all about justice, well, sometimes there are various reasons that you, that, that you may do something that the law considers wrong. And in those instances, mercy may kind of counterbalance that. Um, and, and so we have to be careful that we're all just not, you know, straight letter of the law, jail, jail. Uh, this reminds me of that clip that's been going around with coronavirus. It's like, you undercook fish, straight to jail. You know, like, like, like we got to be a little bit careful here. And, and understand that there may be reasons that somebody committed a certain crime. Now, on the other hand, if, if we go around and, and everybody that commits a crime that was abused as a child or made fun of as a child, and, and we let everybody off without any punishment, well, that's going to lead to some serious problems as well. And so, again, we have this, uh, the, this balance in the works, especially as it comes to um, crimes. And, and there's a lot of gospel insights into this as well uh, that I hope that you will uh, think about and consider as, as you study the law. Okay, so we start our analysis of the law with this very important, uh, with these two important elements, right? The, the idea that 
there has to be an act, a wrong act, as well as a wrong mental state, a, a mental state that shows criminal intent. Now, 99% of the laws are like this. Um, and, and, and I think this is obvious why, and, and, and a couple examples will, will help explain this, the, the system that we have. For example, it's wrong to steal, right? We, we've got laws on the books about theft, robbery, burglary, and all of these have their own specific definitions. And, uh, but, but let's just stick with like larceny, um, taking something from somebody else that, that wrongfully, right? Uh, well, wrongfully, that's the mental state. So, and, and you can see why this is important because maybe in class, you get up to leave class, assuming we were together this semester, you, you stand up for my class, walk out the door, and as you do so, you grab a pen, thinking that it's your pen. Well, it turned out that it's my pen. And, and so did you commit the act? Well, absolutely, you have committed the crime. You took something that wasn't yours. Should you be prosecuted and put in jail for that? Well, all of you are like, please no. And, and, and you're right. You didn't have the, you didn't have the, it, your mental state wasn't such that you were thinking, I'm going to take Brother Hales's pen. Or you know, like, let's ramp this up a little bit. My car, like, like you get into a car, you thought it was yours. The key was in the ignition, just like you always have your key in the ignition. Does anybody ever do that? I hope not. Um, and, and you start it up and you drive away. Well, it's my car, not your car. Well, as long as you didn't have the intent to steal a car and you have that valid legal excuse of, I thought it was mine and here are all the reasons why, and it's all logical and reasonable, well, you're not going to, you're not going to be, well, one, you probably won't ever be prosecuted for that. But if you were, you like, there, there's like a 0% chance that you would be convicted and go to jail for that. Why? Because like I said, you've got a reasonable and logical excuse for your actions. I, and, and again, if you didn't commit, so, so that's the mens rea, that's the mental state. Um, the other element here is the act, the actus reus, if we go back to the Latin root of everything that we just love to do. Um, if you didn't do the act, but you thought about it, like, like, again, let's go back to the pen example. You think, you know, that is a really nice pen that Brother Hales left here next to me. Um, I'm going to take it. And then, you know, your, your shoulder angel poofs into existence and says, don't. Don't do that. It's it's that's wrong, and and you, and you listen to your conscience. You listen to the Holy Ghost and say, okay, never like I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be righteous, and you walk out. Well, can you be prosecuted for that? Of course not. You didn't do the act. You didn't you didn't take my pen. All right. So so again, the law requires both of these. You have to do the act with the wrong wrongful mental state. Okay. Um, now uh, I guess this is worth telling one kind of fun story. Well, fun if like in a terrible, illegal way. Um, when I was young, I, I think I told you the story about my grandpa and the railroad tracks and all of that. Yeah, that same grandpa, um, uh, he, he told me once, I was probably like six or seven, uh, and he lived in Las Vegas, but they'd often go hunting in Southern Utah and uh where he grew up and and uh anyway he got back from one of these trips just as i our family had come to visit in las vegas and and i remember him telling this story that night he's like you know we were uh we were hunting and um and i saw this bird and it and it, and it was flying up and i and i just instinctively grabbed my shotgun and pulled the trigger and um Anyway, the, the way that he made the story sound at the time was like the, the bird was slowly coming, to, like it had been shot, but it was slowly coming down. And as it got closer and closer to the ground, gr my grandpa said something like, we, or maybe it was my uncle. Anyway, I, it might have been my uncle. He's like, we, we saw it coming down and we just said, mm, we're out of here. And they left and they got in their truck and drove away as quickly as, I, as they could. And, and me as like a six or seven year old, I still could understand why they did that. Like, it, 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 and all of you are like, oh my gosh, your grandpa shot a bald eagle. And, uh, and yeah, 
that that that's what I got out of all of this is my grandpa shot a, a bald eagle. Now now this is an interesting law because on the books, um, it, there's no mental state. So this is one of those few exceptions, right, where the law defines uh, the criminal act here of you know, the act of shooting um, the national bird, the bald eagle. It just says it shall be illegal in the United States and its territories to shoot a bald eagle. I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but that's what it says. There's no mental state involved. It doesn't matter. Like I thought it was a turkey or I thought it was a pigeon or I thought it was a hawk or whatever it is, people are shooting out of the air. That's not the law. The law is it's illegal to shoot a bald eagle. Why? Because this one is just important enough that we think we don't care about the mental state. We don't care if it was a mistake. It's still illegal to shoot a bald eagle. So, um, but again, remember that's the exception. 99% of the laws have require that you commit both the act and have the requisite wrongful mental state, the, the act and the mental state. All right, so with that in mind, let's check out this example here. A 14 year old girl posts a Facebook message saying she is going to shoot students at school the next day. Police arrest her for making a terrorist threat. And here I define what a terrorist threat is. It's, it involves one, the intent to terrorize, mental state. Um, sorry, the act is, is terrorize. So the intent that will go to the mental state, but the act is terrorization, um, terrorizing somebody. Um, and, and then it's got this interesting, or reckless disregard, so terrorizing with reckless disregard of the risks. So let's, let's kind of piece this, uh, or what we say, parse this law a little bit. Can this girl be prosecuted and potentially convicted for making a Facebook post that says she is going to shoot students at school? Okay, now, as this next paragraph here at the bottom says, her defense is, I was never going to do it. I didn't mean it. Um, so the question is, can she still be prosecuted? Well, let's go back to this. Was there an intent to terrorize? Well, maybe not, right? Because if she says it was a joke, she didn't mean it. She was never going to do it. Did she really have the intent to terrorize? Well, maybe she might have. Um, but again, we, we don't, we don't totally know. We, we can guess from her actions that she did, but she's probably got a pretty good chance of winning that. Why? Because again, you kind of have to get into her mind to really know this and look at her other actions to determine her intent. But again, if it's like once and she's a joker all the time, then she might get off on this by using those defenses. Like, I've never done this. I, I, I've, I'm a happy, joke, jokeful, joking, jovial person. Um, and, and that may get her off, except for this or, right? So it's intent to terrorize or terror, making a terrorist threat in reckless disregard of the risks. Was she reckless? This is the, this is the other mental state, right? Was she reckless? in putting a Facebook post saying that she's gonna shoot students at school. Well, with that one, I think all of us in the whole class are like, yeah, that's dumb. If it's dumb, it's probably reckless. And even if she was joking, even if she was kidding, even if she's happy and everybody should know that this was a joke, was she still reckless in posting that message on Facebook? And if she was, she could be prosecuted. Um, under this law. So, so that's the way that I want you to analyze these issues. And on exams, it'll look a lot like this example. I'll say, you know, here's what happened. Here's what the law says. Tell me what the answer is. And, and you'll have to make a judgment call. All right. Now, all of this is important for our studies because now, um, and, and I believe this was a change under the Sarbanes- Sarbanes-Oxley Act of, this is like 15 years ago, 
that now says that businesses can be criminally prosecuted. This didn't used to be the case. It was only the officers and directors of a business that could be um, criminally prosecuted. But after Enron, lots of things changed. And one of them was now you can criminally prosecute a business. And that's important for us because that Marriott case that I just posted to Twitter is this exact same issue. Okay, so um, again, that that's now we could go into a long philosophical discussion about why they did that. I think it's fairly simple. Um, if you can prosecute a corporation under criminal statutes, then yeah, you can't throw the corporation in jail. That's not possible but you can get criminal fines out of the business. And that's what's important right there. Um, okay, so uh, again, now uh, this second part down here, if you become a corporate officer or director, you could be liable for the, uh, for the crimes of subordinates if it's your job to oversee that person. Uh, one of the best lines in Suits, which many of you are now watching and telling me about is when Harvey Specter's talking to like, like the CEO of a business. And he says, you know, Harvey, I didn't know. And, and Harvey says, yeah, it was your job to know. Right? And, and, and the law recognizes that and can hold CEOs criminally liable for acts that they didn't even do if it was their job to know what was going on. Okay. So uh, again, this is just something to be aware of, especially as many of you will work your way up into upper management eventually uh, perhaps becoming a member of the board of directors of a business. Uh, this slide, I'm just going to kind of let this sit for the most part. I, I could talk all day about all the different crimes, but uh, listed in the text are the crimes that you need to know. And during the exam, if I talk about a crime that isn't in the reading or in these slides, I will just, um, I'll define it for you uh, on the exam itself. Okay. So, Kind of the, the main ones, though, that you need to understand, embezzlement is a, is a major one. That's, that's misappropriation of somebody else's money, meaning uh, embezzlement is a lot like blackmail, um, uh, taking money through an unlawful way. Typically, it's done through the, the, the threat of either force or bribe or some other like, like mental threat. Uh, that it's a big body of law. Now, mail and wire, wire fraud, man, this is, this is how the FBI prosecutes people, All right? And, and remember, mail and wire fraud, these are federal crimes, which means they were passed by Congress. Always go back to our Commerce Clause discussion um, because Congress criminalized um, uh, any fraud that crosses state lines. They had to do that because of the Commerce Clause, right? Like it had to have some effect on interstate commerce. And it used to be like they could only prosecute crimes that, that actually crossed state lines. But the law was written that the FBI, meaning federal agents, could prosecute crimes not where the, the crime itself crosses state lines, but where the the communication crosses state lines. Well, now many of you know this, like um, the main servers in the country are like, well, there's one in Toronto, so uh, in Canada, and, and then there's others in like Atlanta, um, Utah has a big server, it, like uh, for example, Amazon. Um, Anyway, I'm getting into too much detail. The, the issue is though, when you send an email, it's crossing state lines, even if, like, like here I am in Lubbock, te Texas, even if I sent an email to the next door neighbor, that email would cross state lines. Why? Because the email used servers in, let's say, South Carolina, and then it would come back to Lubbock, Texas. And because of that, it could constitute a federal crime because the fraud crossed state lines. Um, super important, uh, mail and wire fraud. Uh, most people don't use mail anymore, but it's that wire fraud that the federal government uses to, to get people. So um, examples that I put on here of like some, some fraud, 
uh, the African Prince email scam. Uh, some of my students don't know what this is, and that's that, that, that's a real disappointment um, because in the early days of the internet, everybody would get emails from an African prince and, and it was always in some different country. Like sometimes it was Nigeria, other times it was, um, oh gosh, Ghana or, or, or Somalia. And, and it was always this prince and it would always start off with something like, good day, sir. Um, anyway, and then it would go into detail about how this, this prince was being investigated by the federal government or something, something that would say like really bizarre things like, like, like the Federation of Governments of Switzerland or something. And, and I need to get my money out of this bank account, but it has to go to a U.S. citizen. Would you help? And if, and if you took this $3 million and routed it through your account, then I'll let you keep $1 million. And people are like, yes, I will take a million dollars. And they'd, and they would send their bank account information to this person who knows where, like they could have been in Jamaica or, 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 or Vermont or, you know, anywhere in the world. And, and they, were, they would get people's bank account information, drain it, close everything up, and then that's how they made their money. That's how the scam worked. Um, so, so there's that. And then, um, the, like right now, the federal government is, ter- is, is shutting down, uh, primarily it's the FBI, shutting down a lot of websites that are scams. Um, so we had the Puerto Rico hurricane a couple of years ago, and all of a sudden, like, you would see ads like, donate to Puerto Rican hurricane victims, and really it was just a scam. Uh, right now we're seeing it with COVID-19. Um, the, the, the FBI is watching a ton of scams that are, that are happening right now. I should tweet one of those out to you as well. All right. And then another crime that we're going to focus on later is trade secrets. Uh, and we'll talk about this more when we get to intellectual property in about four or five weeks. Um, and, and, and so let's, let's hold off on that one. We're going to read a great case about that as well. Um, but yeah, these are just some of the federal crimes that, that business people and businesses can commit. Now, let's say that you do one of these. Maybe you embezzled. Maybe um, you committed wire fraud. It doesn't mean you're going to jail. There, the, 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 um, the system has built in a number of defenses to every crime. Uh, and, and here I've listed self-defense, mistake, duress, entrapment. Uh, you know about uh, some of these, others we'll, we'll cover later on, but mistake can actually get you out of a lot of crimes. If, if it was an accident that you sent an email to somebody else uh, asking for money, like, like you meant to send it to a business associate, but you sent it to a client or something, and they sent money wrongfully, well, your defense could be, sorry, judge, that was a mistake. Um, uh, yeah, now, uh, everybody can claim mistake. You still have to prove that to a jury to prove that it was a legitimate mistake and not some contrived defense just to get you out of the wrongful thing that you did, but it exists for that reason. Some people make mistakes and if they had, if they made a mistake and that negates the mental state element of the crime, then they won't be convicted of it. Okay, so uh, that that's important. Now, duress. Yeah, you you'll we'll we'll talk more about that later. That's just like somebody put a gun to your head and said, "Commit fraud, or otherwise I'm going to shoot you." Like like that's duress. Uh, entrap entrapment is an interesting one. This is the idea that if not for the actions of the police or some other government agent you wouldn't have committed the crime. Okay, so I, I think the best way to understand this one is that like 10 years ago, there was this show on TV, super popular. It was called To Catch a Predator. And this was classic TV. This was good TV. It was like the bad guys getting their due. And, and what would happen is you would have a federal agent or a, a state police, uh, it was often the state police and they would get online and create a social media page for a fake 14 year old girl. 
All right, so this 14, uh, this, you know, fake 14 year old girl, it's really like a 38 year old man or something, but creates this uh, little profile for Jessica Williams or something. And, um, and Jessica Williams is a 14 year old girl, lives with her single mom and is really lonely and is looking for friends. Well, invariably, you've got a bunch of sick people out there on the internet that want to befriend this little 14-year-old girl, and so they start communicating, and then it turns sexual, and then um, the police would say something like, hey, you know, I'd, I'd really like to get to know you better. My mom's going to be out of town next weekend. Do you want to come over? And, and the, the, the sickos writing to this 14 year old girl are like, yeah, give me your address and I'll show up at six. And, and, and as soon as they would show up, the host of this show to catch a predator, I can't remember his name, um, but he'd always be sitting in the kitchen. Right. And, and the guy would walk in and, and there's the host of this show with a bunch of cameras. And sometimes the guys would run. Other times the host would be like, no, come in, sit down. And they would like, unbelievable, but they'd just come and sit down and apologize and say they knew what they were doing was wrong. But they, anyway, but like, well, what happened is all of these people, eventually they try to run and the police would be like staked out around the house. So they'd grab them and tackle them and haul them off to, to, uh, to jail, uh, to the local prison. And, um, and, and a lot of them started getting off because they said that those initial emails from the 14 year old girl who was really a police officer uh, constitute an entrapment because they would have never instigated a lot of these things if that, if not for the police officer who's pretending to be a 14 year old girl hadn't brought up certain things like, like how she was lonely and, 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 and they basically they were saying Look, it's the police's fault that, like, in posing as this 14 year old girl, they enticed me unlawfully to commit crimes that I wouldn't otherwise do because of the things said, et cetera. And, and a lot of them started getting um, acquitted, meaning uh, that they were walking after doing these horrible things um, or trying to do horrible things. Uh, fortunately, they're like like in these cases there wasn't a 14 year old girl really being victimized but it did expose that a lot of this was going on in the u.s and uh, it frightened a lot of people and, and that was part of the show too and it just made you feel good to watch these perverts getting thrown into a police car and taken away um, but like i said it got shut down uh, because of entrapment and also because uh, in one of the later episodes, that I think it was a judge got into this and was soliciting a 14-year-old girl. And when the police showed up to arrest him, he shot himself. And then the show had lawsuits with not only entrapment, but the wrongful death of this guy. And, um, and, and it, I think that kind of led to the end of that show. Um, but again, these are the defenses, and, and uh, you can use these for pretty much every white collar crime that's out there. Um, so this, this image right here, uh, th this, is, this is my first boss. So this is Bill Iraq, I should say my first legal boss. Um, the first firm that I clerked at while I was in law school was Lerac Coglin was the name of the firm then. Uh, they've had to change. Uh, one of the reasons they had to change was that Bill Iraq, who you see right here, uh, ended up going to jail uh, for violating some federal laws interestingly enough now um I, I met bill a couple times when i worked at the firm um interesting interest like like not a harvey specter uh um maybe more of a lewis lit but it, it's hard to like pin down who, who this guy is um brilliant uh, absolutely absolutely brilliant attorney and um and, and created a a law firm where they would go after um, companies that committed fraud and specifically securities fraud. Now, now what he's got on this diagram that, that you can't really see, I think this is worth, this is worth a second to kind of explain how this law firm worked. So um, let, me, let me do a new share here and show you 
kind of what was on that whiteboard that he's got right there. All right, so um, here, let's say, I'm going to draw, uh, this is a rough estimate of what the Enron stock price looked like, right? And, and actually, Bill Lurat came to uh, USD to the law school to actually talk about this with the students, and it, it was uh, quite incredible. Um, so again, here we've got Enron stock. And, and, and along these dates, um, you can see it, it, it ebbs and flows just like any stock. And what, what our law firm did, what Lerat Coughlin did at the time was sue corporations like Enron to recoup the losses that the investors suffered at the hands of a corrupt company. And, and I think if I draw this, it'll make a little bit more sense. This is how this law firm made a ton of money, by the way. All right, so you've got Enron growing, as you see here, like these different stages. And what they did to win this case, to prove that, because you see the losses here, like, like, like if you tracked the loss from here to here, this, sure, the, the stock price might have, like, let's say it, went from $50 a share down to here. We've, let's just for simplicity's sake, say it went down to $50. So that's this. And this is uh, $5 a share right here. Well, that's a 45, like, like you accountants should be very proud of me. Uh, that's a $45 per share loss. And, and that's, you know, that's disappointing if, if you own one share in Enron. The problem was there were millions and millions of shares of Enron. And, and so this represents like, and I'm not kidding, billions of dollars in losses for everybody cumulative that had invested in Enron. Okay, so what the law firm had to do, because the law firm wanted to recoup billions and give it back to, this is how you, abbreviate shareholders, by the way, and give it back to the shareholders. And so um, that's a five. I was going to do five per share, but whatever. We'll just leave it at five. Um, anyway, um, to get that money back in the hands of the shareholders to recoup that, well, you're never going to recoup everything. Why? Because the stock price was artificially high. What they had to do is show that directors officers of Enron had committed fraud and show through statistics that it had resulted in losses for the company itself and the share price, the stock price. And basically, like they lost one case early on because the judge said, look, we know there was fraud, but you have to be able to show like with some statistical analysis that um, that the loss in the stock price was a result of the fraud committed by the officers and directors of the company. And so it was kind of like a blow to the law firm, but it basically told the law firm what they had to do in order to win these things. And it's not that hard, right? Because like this spot right here, let's draw a circle, right? Oh, goodness right here all right let's say that right here um the ceo of enron gives a statement the ceo says something like and i'm going to paraphrase we are secure we are strong we uh, our financial statements are accurate Right, something that is demonstrably anyway, it is it can easily be proven that it is false. So let's say right there, that's when the that's when the CEO said it. And then you've got this area. Here I should make this a different color. Um, and then you've got all of this right here. This growth right here is attributable 
through statistics, we can kind of figure this out because earlier the like um, the stock price was growing at a regular pace and then a statement was made and let's just say that it it caused the stock price to jump up higher than it used to. I'm gonna clear some of this out. All right, so it used to just be growing at this pace, but then this statement was made and all of a sudden it shot up a little bit higher than it used to. You can show this through statistics, by the way. This is, this is impressive stuff. And all of a sudden it peaks right here. Now this line that I drew right here, this, this line, this is what we call the truth. The truth comes out, right? Like the auditors found a problem with the financial statements. And as soon as that happened, like, let me put the big X marks the spot, the stock price plummets. It goes down, 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 all the way until it hits the bottom. That's fraud. And we could statistically, with relative surety, show that this statement right here, this false statement, this fraud, was the cause This has caused the decreased stock price. And if we could do that, then we could recoup money out of the CEO, the other board, um, other wrongful actors, and take that money and give it back to the shareholders right there. Okay, now the, the crazy thing about this firm is that like most firms, there was a contingency fee. So, so the firm would have to represent the shareholders, and we call that a class. You've heard this with like class actions. So the law firm represents all 3 million shareholders in Enron. Okay, and, and we that means we represent the whole class. Um, and when we do that, like, like every shareholder, sure, they lost $45 per share, but like, like a lot of the money's just gone because it was fraudulent to begin with. And so maybe we only recover $10 per share, but that's still billions of dollars. And in this, and in this case, the firm actually recovered something like, I think it was $7 billion. Well, the crazy thing with law firm, when you represent a class, You'll get a. You work on a contingency basis, meaning you're not. The shareholders aren't all getting together to purchase or, or to pay your legal fees. Um, the the way that it works is at the end of the day, if you win the case, then you get to keep a certain percentage. Something like like most contingency arrangements are like the law firm gets to keep thirty percent of the money recovered. Well, when you have billion dollar judgments, like. Um, Lerat Coughlin did with Enron and WorldCom and, and Merrill Lynch and a number of other lawsuits that the firm had going on. Uh, and you're getting billions of dollars recovered. That law firm was like flush with cash. Um, and so, yeah, we, the, but like it was kind of fun to be a clerk at that firm because even though I was like a clerk, I mean, I was like the lowest person on the totem pole at Lerat Coughlin. Um, I saw all kinds of benefits. Like we, we had, we, we could go to Padres games and, you know, we were like three rows up from third base. It was nuts. Like that. It was incredible. Um, but like I said, Bill Iraq ended up going to jail for committing federal crimes himself. Um, and, and it's somewhat complicated dealt with solicitation of clients and, and some other things, uh, and went to jail. Um, for a number of years, like to a federal prison, uh, you probably heard of like white collar prisons. Uh, it's basically where he went, got out and was offered a job teaching securities law at UC Irvine. So if you go to UC Irvine, you could actually take a class from Bill Lerac, a convicted felon. So there you go. Um, okay, let's get back onto uh, the screen here. So um, coming back here to We'll jump past Bill Iraq. Um, Theranos, let, let's just um, 
let's end the class right now because Theranos I'm going to save for Friday when we meet together. But these are just some questions that I want you to think about as we as you do the reading, the, the case study for Enron. I think it's just incredible uh, and it's recent and it just happened. And it's like, it's really like, like this generation's, this decade's Enron. It's, it's that big. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop talking because I get so excited about it. But um, that ends our uh, criminal law class. And so next time we'll pick up with um, torts. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you.